Zechariah 4, verse 12, For who has despised the day of small things? A sermon preached before the governor and council in the House of Assembly in Georgia on January 28, 1770, George Whitfield. Men, brethren, and fathers, it's under times and in diverse manners God spake to the fathers by the prophets before. He spoke to us in these last days by his Son, and his God is a sovereign agent. And as his sacred spirit blows when and where it lists, surely he may reveal and make known his will to his creatures when, where, and how he pleases. And who shall say to him, What doest thou? Indeed, this seems to be one of reason to display sovereignty why he chose before the canon of scripture was settled, made known his mind in such various methods, and to such a variety of his servants and messengers. Hence it is that we hear he talked with Abraham as a man talks with a friend. To Moses, he spoke face to face. To others, by dreams in the night, or by visions impressed strongly on their imaginations. This seems to be frequently the happy lot of the favorite evangelical prophet Zechariah. I call him evangelical prophet because his predictions, however, they pointed at some approaching or immediate event ultimately terminated in God, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of all, the living oracles of God. The chapter from which our text is selected, among many other passages, is a striking proof of this. An angel that had been more than once sent to him on former occasions appears again to him and by way of vision woke him to use his own words as a man that is wakened out of sleep. Prophets and the great servants of God need waking sometimes out of their drowsy frames. Methinks I see this man of God staring out of his sleep and being all attention. The angel asked him, What do you see? He answers, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold, an emblem of the church of God, with a bull upon the top of it, seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes too the seven lamps which were upon the top of it, implying that the church, however reduced to the lowest ebb, should be preserved, be kept supplied and shining, though the invisible but not less real, because invisible aids and operations of the blessed Spirit of God, the occasion of such an extraordinary vision. If we compare this passage with the second chapter of the prophecy of the prophet Haggai, seems to be this, it was now near eighteen years since the Jewish people had been delivered from their long and grievous Babylonian captivity, and being so long deprived of their temple and its worship, which fabric had been raised even to the ground. One would have imagined that immediately upon their return they should have postponed all private works, and, with their united strength, have first set about rebuilding that once stately and magnificent structure. But they, like too many Christians, of a like lukewarm stamp, though all acknowledged that this church work was a necessary work, yet put themselves and others off with this godly pretense. The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Time has not come. What? Not in eighteen years? For so long had they now been returned from their state of bondage, and pray, why was not the time come? The prophet Haggai tells them their whole time was so taken up building for an habitation for the great and glorious benefactor, the mighty God of Jacob. This ingratitude must not be passed by unpunished. Omniscience observes. Omnipotence resents it. And that they might read their sin and their punishment, as they thought it best to get rich and secure houses and lands and estates for themselves before they set about unnecessary church work. The prophet tells them, You have sown much, but bring in little. Ye eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Still, he goes on thundering and lightning. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, pleasing yourselves with your fine crops, I did blow upon it. Why? 
the Lord of hosts says, because of mine house it is waste. And you run every man to his own house. A thundering sermon this. Deliver not only to the common people, but also to the presence of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. The prophet's report is believed. And the arm of the Lord was revealed. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek. O oh, happy times when church and state are thus combined, all the remnant of the people. And he obeyed the voice of the Lord, or God. And the words of Haggai, the prophets, the spirit of Zerubbabel and of Joshua, and the spirits of all the remnant of the people were stirred up. And they immediately came, disregarding as it were their own private buildings, and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. For a while they proceeded with vigor. The foundation of the house is laid and the superstructure raised to some considerable height. But whether this fit of hot zeal soon cooled, as is too common, or the people were discouraged by the false representations of their enemies, which perhaps met with too favorable a reception as the court of Dyrus, it so happened that the hearts of the magistrates and ministers of the people waxed faint, and an awful chasm intervened between the finishing and laying the foundation of this promising and glorious work. Upon this, another prophet, even Zechariah, who with Haggai had been joint sufferers in the captivity, is sent to lift up the hands that hang down, to strengthen the feeble knees, and by the foregoing instructive vision to reanimate Joshua and the people in general, in the heart of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, in particular, Mogger all discouragements, either from inveterate enemies, or from timid, unstable friends, or all other obstacles whatsoever. If Haggai thunders, Zechariah's message is as lightning. This is of the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, not barely by human power or policy, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, thou sand ballot, and your associates, who have been so long crying out, what mean these feeble Jews, however great, formidable, and seemingly insurmountable, before Zerubbabel, you shall not only be lowered and rendered more accessible, but become a plain. Your very opposition shall in the end promote the work and help to expedite that very building which you intend to put a stop to and destroy. Unless the rubble, through unbelief and outward opposition, or for want of more bodily strength, should think this would be a work of time, and that he should not live to see it completed in his days, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, The hands of the rubble have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And he shall bring forth the headstones of it with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Grace, grace unto it. A double acclamation to show that out of the abundance of their hearts, their mouth spake. And this with shoutings and crying from all quarters, even their enemies should see the hand and providence of God in the beginning, continuance, and ending of this seemingly improbable and impracticable work so that they should be constrained to cry, Grace, unto it, in which both the work and the builders much prosperity. But, as for his friends, they should be so transported with heartfelt joy in the reflection upon the signal providences which had attended them through the whole process, that they would shout and cry, Grace, grace unto it, or, This is nothing but the Lord's doing. God prosper and bless us work more and more, and make it a place where his free grace and glory may be abundantly displayed. Then, by a beautiful and pungent sarcasm, turning to the insulting enemies, he utters a spirited interrogation in my text, who has despised a day of small things. Who are you? Did wantonly said, What can these feeble Jews do? pretending to lay the foundation of a house which they never will have money, or strength, or power to finish. 
or who are you? O timorous, short-sighted, doubting, dull well-meaning people, who through unbelief or discouraged at the small beginnings and feebleness of the attempt to build a second temple, and because you thought it could not come up to the magnificence of the first, therefore were discouraged from so much as beginning to build a second at all. A close, instructive question is, a question implying that whenever God intends to bring about any great thing, he generally begins with a day of small things. As a proof of this, I will not lead you so far back as to the beginning of time, when the everlasting I Am spoke all things into existence by His almighty fiat, and out of a confused chaos, without form and void, produce a world worthy of God to create, and of His favorite creature man, his vicegerent and representative here below, to inhabit and enjoy in it both himself and his God. And yet, though the heavens declare his glory, and the firmament shows his handiwork, though there is nor speech nor language where their voice is not heard, and their line is gone out to all the world, and by a dumb yet persuasive language proves the hand that made them to be divine, yet there have been, and are now, such fools in the world, is to say in their hearts, there is no God? They're so wise as by their wisdom not to know God, own his divine image to be stamped on that book, wherein these grand things are recorded, and that, in such legible characters that he who runs may read. Neither will I divert your attention, honored fathers, to the histories of Greece and Rome, or any of the great kingdoms and renowned monarchies, which constitute so great a part of ancient history, but whose beginnings were very small, witness Romulus's ditch, their progress as remarkably great, and their declension and downfall when arrived at their appointed zenith, as sudden, unexpected, and marvelous, these make the chief subjects of the learning of our schools, though they make but a mean figure in sacred history and would not perhaps have been mentioned at all had they not been in some measure connected with the history of God's people, which is a grand subject of that much despised book, emphatically called the Scriptures. Whoever has a mind to inform himself of the one may read Roland's ancient history, and whoever would see the connection with the other may consult the learned Predo's admirable and judicious connection both which I hope will be strenuously recommended and carefully studied when this present infant institution gathers more strength and grows up into a seat of learning. I can hardly forbear mentioning the final beginnings of Great Britain. Now, so distinguished for liberty, opulence, and renown, and the rise and rapid progress of the American colonies, which promises to be one of the most opulent and powerful empires in the world, but my present views and the honors done this infant institution this day, in the words of my text, as well as the feelings of my own heart, and I trust of the hearts of all that hear me, lead me to confine your meditations to the history of God's own peculiar people, which for the simplicity and sublimity of its language, the veracity of its author, and the importance and wonders of the facts therein recorded, if weighed in a proper balance, is not its equal under the sun. And yet, though God himself has become an author among us, we will not condescend to give his book one thorough reading. Be astonished, O heavens, at this. Who would have thought that from once, even from Abraham, and from so small a beginning as the immigration of a single private family, called out of a land wholly given to idolatry, to be sojourners and pilgrims in a strange land. Who would have thought that from a man, who for a long season was written childless, a man whose first possession in a strange land was by purchasing a burying place for his wife, and in whose grave one might have imagined he would have buried all future expectations. Who would have thought that from this very man and woman, according to the course of nature, both, as good as dead, should descend a numerous offspring like unto the stars of heaven for multitude, 
It is a sand which is upon the sea, shore, innumerable. Nay, who would have imagined that against all probability, and in all human appearance impossible, a kingdom should arise? Behold, a poor captive stave, even Joseph, who was cruelly separated from his brethren, became second in Pharaoh's kingdom, which sent before to work out a great deliverance, and to introduce a family which should take root, deep root downwards, and bear fruit upwards, and fill the land. How could it enter into the heart of man to conceive that when oppressed by a king, who knew not Joseph, though they were the best, most loyal, industrious subjects this king had, when an edict, which issued forth as impolitic, is cruel, since the safety and glory of all kingdoms chiefly consist in the number of its inhabitants, that an outcast, helpless infant should be taken, and bred up in all the learning of the Egyptians, in that very cord from which, and by that very tyrant from whom the edict came, and that the deliverer should be nurtured to be king in Jeshurun. But time as well as strength would fail me, was I to give you a detail of all the important particulars respecting God's peculiar people. Is there a miraculous support in the wilderness, the events which took place while they were under a divine theocracy, and during their settlement in Canaan, to the time of their return from Babylon, and from thence, to the destruction of their second temple, and so on, by the Romans? Indeed, considering to whom I am speaking, persons conversant in the sacred and profane history, I have mentioned these things only to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. But, if we descend from the Jewish to the Christian era, we shall find that its commencement was, in the eyes of the world, a day of small things indeed. Our blessed Lord compares the beginning of its progress in the world to a grain of a mustard seed, which, till the smallest of all seeds, when sown, soon becomes a great tree, and so spreads that the birds of the air, or a multitude of every nation, language, and tongue, came and lodged in its branches. In its inward progress in the believer's heart, Christ likens to a little leaven which a woman hid in three measures of meal, how both the Jewish and Christian dispensations have been, and even to this day are despised by the wise disputers of this world. On this very account is manifest to all who read the lively oracles with a becoming attention what ridicule, obloquy, and inveterate opposition Christianity meets with in this our day, not only from the opidiest, but from formal professors, is too evident to every truly pious soul. And what opposition the kingdom of grace meets with in the heart is well known by all those who are experimentally acquainted with their hearts. They know to their sorrow what the great apostle of the Gentiles means by the spirit striving against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. But the sacred oracles and the histories of all ages acquaint us that God brings about the greater thing, not only by small and unlikely means, but by ways and means directly opposite to the carnal reasonings of unthinking men. He chooseth things that be not, to bring to naught those which are. How did Christianity spread and flourish by one who was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and who expired on a cross? He was despised and rejected, not merely by the vulgar and illiterate, but the rabbis and masters of Israel, the scribes and Pharisees, who by the Jewish churchmen were held too high in so high a reputation for their outward sanctity that it became a common proverb, if only two went to heaven, the one would be a scribe and the other a Pharisee. Yet there were they who endeavored to silence the voice of all of his miracles and heavenly doctrines with, Is not this a carpenter's son? Nay, he is mad. Why hear you him? He hath a devil, and casts out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And their despite not only followed him too, but after death and when in the grave. We remember, they said, that this deceiver said that after three days I will arise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure. But, mugger all your impotent precautions in sealing the stone. 
and setting a watch, burst a bars of death asunder and according to his repeated predictions, proves himself to be the Son of God with power by rising the third day from the dead. And afterwards, in pretense of great multitudes, was he received up into glory. As proof of it, he sent down the Holy Ghost, on the mission of whom he pawned all his credit with his disciples, in such an instantaneous, amazing manner as one would imagine should have forced and compelled all who sought to own that this was indeed the finger of God. Yet how was this great transaction treated with the utmost contempt, when instantaneously the apostles commenced orators and linguists, and with the divine profusion spoke of the wonderful things of God. These men said some are full of new wine, yet by these men mean fishermen, illiterate men, idiots in the opinion of the scribes and Pharisees, notwithstanding all the opposition of earth and hell, and that to only by the foolishness of preaching did this grain of mustard seed grow up, till thousands, ten thousands of thousands, a multitude which no man could number, out of every nation, language, and people, came and lodged under the branches of it. Neither shall it rest here, Whatever dark parenthesis may intervene, we are assured, being still watered by the same divine hand, it shall take deeper and deeper root downward, and bear more and more fruit upward, till the whole earth be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Who shall live when God does this? Hasten, O Lord, that blessed time. Let this your kingdom come. Come not only by the external preaching of the gospel in the world, but by its renovating, heart-renewing, soul-transforming power to awaken sinners. For want of this, alas, alas, so we understand all mysteries, could speak with the tongues of men and angels. We should only be like sounding brass or so many tinkling cymbals. And yet, what a dear small thing is a first hymn plantation of the seed of divine life in the soul of man. Well, might our Lord, who alone is the author and finisher of our faith, compare it to a little leaven, which a woman took, and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Lo, similes, mean comparisons ease in the eyes of those who have an eye see not, who have an ears hear not, whose heart, being wax grows, cannot, will not understand, to such. It is despicable, mysterious, and unintelligible in its description, and if possible, infinitely more so when made effectual by the power of God to the salvation of any individual soul. For the wisdom of God will always be foolishness to natural men. As it was formerly, so it is now. They who are born after the flesh will persecute those that are born after the spirit. The disciple must be as his master. They that will live godly in him, they that live most godly in him, must, shall suffer persecution. This is so interwoven in the very nature and existence of the gospel, that our Lord makes it one part of the Beatitudes. In that blessed sermon which he preached, when he used the words of my old familiar friend, the seraphic Hervey, a mount was his pulpit, and the heavens his sounding board, a part which, like others of the same nature, I believe, will be little relished by such who are always clamoring against those few highly favored souls who dare stand up and preach the doctrine of justification by faith alone in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, in a reproach with the not preaching like their master, morality, is a term it, in its glorious Sermon on the Mount, for did we more preach and more live it, we should soon find all manner of evil would be spoken against us for Christ's sake. But shall this hinder the progress, the growth, and consummation? And shall the Christian therefore be dismayed and discouraged? God forbid. On the contrary, the weakest believer may and ought to rejoice and be exceeding glad. And why? For a good reason. Because he that has begun the good work has engaged also to finish it. Till Christ found him as black as hell, he shall present him in every individual purchase with his blood, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing before the divine presence. 
O oh, glorious prospect! How will the saints triumph, and the sons of God then shout for joy? If they shouted when God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and if there is joy in heaven over one sinner only that repents, how will the heavenly arches echo and rebound with praise, when all the redeemed of the Lord shall appear together, and the Son of God shall say of all these, that you have given me, have I lost nothing? On the contrary, what weeping, welling, and gnashing of teeth will there be, not only amongst the devil and his angels, but amongst the fearful and unbelieving, when they see that all the hellish temptations and devices, instead of destroying, were overruled to the furtherance of the gospel in general, and to the increase and growth of grace in every individual believer in particular. And how will despisers and behold and wonder and perish, when they shall be obliged to say, We fools counted their lives madness, and their end to be without honor. But how are they numbered among the children of God? And how happy is their lot among the saints? But whither am I going? Pardon me, my dear hearers, if you think this to be a digression from my main point. It is true. While I am musing, the fire begins to kindle. I am flying, but not so high, I trust, as to lose sight of my main subject. And yet, after meditating and talking of the rise and progress of the gospel of the kingdom, I shall find it somewhat difficult to descend so low as to entertain you with the small beginnings of this infant colony and of the orphan house in which I am now preaching. But I should judge myself inexcusable on this occasion if I did not detain you a little longer in taking a transient view of the traces of divine providence in the rise and progress of the colony in general and the institution of this orphan house in particular. Children yet unborn, I trust, will have occasion to bless God for both. The very design of this settlement, as charity inclines us to hope all things, was that it might be an asylum, a place of business, for as many as were in distress, for foreigners as well as natives, for Jews and Gentiles, February 1st, a day the memory of which I think should still be perpetuated. The first embarkation was made with forty-five English families, men who had once lived well in their native country, and who, with many persecuted Salzburgers headed by a good old soldier of Jesus lately deceased, the Reverend Mr. Bullseyes came to find a refuge here. They came, they saw, they labored and endeavored to settle, but by an essential though well-meant defect in the very beginning of the settlement too well known by some now present, and too long and too much felt to bear repeating, prohibiting the importation and use of Negroes and so on, their numbers gradually diminished. Enters were brought to so low an ebb that the whole colony became a proverb of reproach. About this time in the year 1737, being previously stirred up thereto by a strong impulse, which I could by no means resist, I came here, after the example of my worthy and reverend friends, Messrs. John and Charles Wesley, and Mr. Ingham, who with the most disinterested views had come here to serve the colony by endeavoring to convert the Indians, became rejoicing to serve the colony also and to become your willing servant for Christ's sake. My friend and father, good Bishop Benson, encouraged me, though my brethren and kinsmen after the flesh, as well as religious friends, opposed it. I came and I saw you. You will not be offended with me to speak the truth, nakedness of the land. Gladly did I distribute about the four hundred pounds sterling which I had collected in England among my poor parishioners. The necessity and propriety of erecting an orphan house was mentioned and recommended before my first embarkation. But thinking it a matter of too great importance to be set about unwarily, I deferred to further prosecution for this laudable design till my return to England in the year 1738, for to have priests' orders. Miserable was the condition of many grown persons as well as children, whom I left behind, the cause I endeavored to plead immediately upon my arrival, but being denied the churches in which I had the year before collected many hundreds for the London charity schools, I endeavored to plead their cause in the fields. 
the people threw in their mites most willingly. Once or twice, I think twenty pounds were collected in copper. The alms were accompanied with many prayers, in which, as I told them late, I am persuaded a blessed foundation to the future charitable superstructure. In a short time, though plucked as it were out of the fire, the collections and charitable contributions amounted to more than one thousand pounds sterling. With that, I re-embarked, taking Philadelphia in my way, and upon my second arrival found the spot fixed upon. But alas, who can describe the low estate to which I was reduced? The whole country almost was left desolate. In a metropolis, a savannah, was but like a cottage in a vineyard, or as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, many orphans whose parents had been taken from them by the distresses that naturally attend new settlements were dispersed here and there in a very forlorn, helpless condition. My bowels yearned towards them, and animated by the example of the great Professor Frank, previous to bringing them here, I hired a house, furnished an infirmary, employed all that were capable of employment, and in a few weeks walked to the house of God with a large family of above sixty orphans, and others, in as bad a condition. On March 25th, 1740, in full assurance of faith, I laid the foundation of this house, and in the year following brought in my orphan family, who with the workmen now made up the number of one hundred and fifty. By the money which was expended on these, the remaining few were kept in the colony, and were unable to pay the debts they owed, so that in a representation made to the House of Commons by some, who for very good reasons wanted the constitution of the colony altered, they declared that the very existence of the colony was in a great measure, if not totally, owing to the building and supporting of the orphan house. Finding the care of such a family incompatible with the care due to a parish, upon giving previous warning to the then trustees, I gave up the living in Savannah, which without fee or reward I had voluntarily taken upon me. I then ranged through the northern colonies and afterwards once more returned home. What calumny! What loads of reproach! I for many years was called to undergo and us turning beggars for a family. Few here present need to be informed. A family, utterly unconnected by any ties of nature. A family, not only to be maintained with food, but clothed and educated also, and that too in the dearest part of His Majesty's dominions, on a pine barren, and in a colony where the use of Negroes was totally denied. This appeared so very improbable that all beholders looked daily for its decline and annihilation. But, blessed be God, the building advanced and flourished, and the wish for a period is now come. After having supported a family for thirty-two years by a change of constitution, and the smiles of government, with liberal donations from the northern and especially the adjacent provinces, the same hands that laid the foundation are now called to finish it by making an addition of a seat of learning, the whole products and profits of which are to go towards the increase of the fund. Is it the beginning for destitute orphans or such use as may be called of God to the sacred ministry of his gospel? I need not call on any here to cry grace, grace unto it, for on the utmost scrutiny of the intention of those employed, in considering the various exercises they have been called to undergo, and the opposition the building has everywhere met with, we may justly say, not by might, nor by power, but by thy spirit, O Lord, has this work been carried on thus far. It is his doing. Let it be marvelous in our eyes. With humble gratitude, therefore, would we now set up our Ebenezer and say, Hitherto thou, Lord, hast helped us. And wherefore should we doubt, but that he who has thus far helped will continue to help when the weary heads of the first founders and present helpers are laid in a silent grave. I am very well aware what an invidious task it must be to a person in my circumstances thus to speak on an affair in which he has been so much concerned. 
I may perhaps think I become a fool in thus glorying, but as I am now, blessed be God, in the decline of life, and as in all probability I shall never be present to celebrate another anniversary, I thought it best to be a little bit more explicit, that if I have spoken anything but truth I may be confronted, and if not, the future ages and future successors may see with what a purity of intention and what various interpositions of providence the work was begun and has been carried on to its present height. It was a reading of a like account written by the late Professor Franck that encouraged me who knows but hereafter that reading something of a similar nature may encourage others to begin and carry on a like work elsewhere. I have set its present height for I would humbly hope that this is, comparatively speaking, only a day of small things, only the dawn of a brighter scene. Private geniuses and individuals, as well as collective bodies, have, like the human body, the nonage, puerile, juvenile estate, before they arrive at their zenith, and their lives as gradually they decline. But yet I would hope to both the province and Bethesda, or but in their puerile or juvenile state, and long, long may they increase, and make large strides till they arrive at a glorious zenith. I mean not merely in trade, merchandise, and opulence, though I'd be far from secluding them from the province, and would be thankful for the advances it has already made, but a zenith of glorious gospel blessings, without which all outward emoluments are less than nothing, or the small dust of the balance, for what? Shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Who can imagine that the prophet Zechariah would be sent to strengthen the hands of Zerubbabel in building and laying the foundation of the temple, if that temple was not to be frequented with worshippers that worship the Father in spirit and truth, the most gaudy fabrics, stately temples, New moon Sabbaths and solemn assemblies are only solemn mockeries God cannot away with. God is shown by the destruction of both the first and second temples. What is to become of the seven churches of Asia? How are all their golden candlesticks overthrown? God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And no longer do I expect that this house will flourish, and when the power of religion is encouraged and promoted, and the persons educated here prosecute their studies, not only to be great scholars, but good saints. Blessed be God, I can say with Professor Franck, that it is in a great measure owing to the disinterested spirit of my first fellow helpers, as well as those who are now employed, that the building has reached to its present height. This I am bound to speak not only in honor to those who are now with God, but those at present before me nor dare I conclude without offering to your excellency our peppercorn of acknowledgement for the countenance you have always shown Bethesda's institutions in the honor you did us last year in laying the first brick of yonder wings and thus doing you have honored Bethesda's God. May long delight to honor you here on earth, and after a life spent to his glory and your country's good, May he honor you to all eternity in placing you at Christ's right hand in the kingdom above. Next to your excellency, my dear Mr. President, I must beg your acceptance both of thanks and congratulations on the annual return of this festival. For you were not only my dear familiar friend and first fellow traveler in this infant province, but you were directed by providence to this spot, laid the second brick of this house, watched, prayed, and wrought for the family's good. A witness of innumerable trials, partner of my joys and griefs, will have now the pleasure of seeing the orphan house a fruitful bow, its branches running over the wall. For this, no doubt, God has smiled upon and blessed you in a manner we could not expect, much less design. And may he continue to bless you with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look to the rock from whence you have been hewn. And may your children never be ashamed that their father left his native country and married a real Christian, born again under this roof. 
In Bethesda's God grant, this may be the happy portion of your children and children's children, gentlemen of His Majesty's Council, Mr. Speaker, and you members of the General Assembly. Many thanks are owing to you for your late address to His Excellency in favor of Bethesda, your joint recommendation of it when I was last here, which, though in some measure, through the bigotry of some, for the present is rendered abortive, but they're wanting to have it confined to a party. Yet I trust the event will prove that everything shall be overruled to the furtherance of the work. Here I repeat what I have often declared, that as far as lies in my power before and after my decease, Bethesda shall always be on a broad bottom. All denominations have freely given. All denominations. All the continent. God being my helper shall receive benefit from it. But Bethesda's God bless you all, in your private as well as public capacity. It is your honor to be the representatives of the now flourishing, increasing people. May you be directed in all your ways. May truth, justice, religion, and piety be established among you to all generations. Lastly, my reverend brethren, and you inhabitants of the colony, accept unfeigned thanks for the honor done me, and let in us see you at Bethesda this day. You, sir, for the sermon preached here last year, tell it in Germany, tell my great good friend Professor Frank that Bethesda's God is a God whose mercy endures forever. Well, let us have your inner prayers. Encourage your people not to despise a day of small things. What has God wrought? From its infamy, this colony has been blessed with many faithful gospel ministers. Oh, that this may be a nursery to many more. This has been the case of the New England College for almost a century. And why not the Orphan House Academy at Georgia? Men, brethren, fathers, as many of you, whether inhabitants or strangers, who have honored this day with your presence, give us the additional blessings of your prayers. And oh, that Bethesda's God may make this day, though but a day of small things, productive of great things to the souls of all amongst whom I have now been preaching the kingdom of God. A great and good day will it indeed be, if Jesus Christ, our great Zerubbabel, should by the power of the eternal spirit bless anything that has now been said to cause every mountain of difficulty that lies in the way of your conversion to become a plain. And what art thou, O great mountain, whether the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life, sin, or self-righteousness, before our Bethesda's God, you shall become a plain. Brethren, my heart is enlarged towards you. It is written, Blessed be God, that it is written, In the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, whether things in heaven, or things in earth, or things under the earth. Oh, that we may be made a willing people in a day of his power. Look, look unto him, all you that are placed in these ends of the earth. This house has often been an house of God, a gate of heaven to some of your fathers. May it be a house of God, a gate of heaven to the children also. Come unto him, all you that are weary and heavy laden. He will give you rest. Rest from the guilt. Rest from the power. Rest from the punishment of sin. Rest from the fear of divine judgments here. Rest with himself eternally hereafter. Fear not. Though the beginnings are but small, Christ will not despise a day of small things. A bruised reed will he not break, and a smoking flax will he not quench, until he bring forth judgment unto victory. His hands that laid the foundation also shall finish it. Yet a little while, and the top stone shall be brought forth with shouting, and men and angels join in crying, Grace, grace unto it, that all present may be in his happy number. May God of his infinite mercy grant, through Jesus our Lord.